Last week, the U.S. government announced that NASA was suspending contacts with its Russian counterpart over the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. However, both countries will continue to work together on the International Space Station. Well, joining me now to discuss that is space journalist and historian James Oberg. James joins us from Houston. Thanks for joining us. Hello, Anand. Thank you. How damaging is this step going to be for these two countries? No one's sure yet exactly what's being stopped because there are contacts, there are exchanges in various projects, there are UN-sponsored activities like COSPAR, the Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space. Those things may, be, may suffer, but the main issue of the space station, which is a partnership that's worked out very well for both countries, seems to be going on unaffected. Does this affect the future of the space station in any way? It doesn't seem, it's not intended to, but what worries me and a lot of other observers who have worked in the space program and have worked with Russians and worked very productively with them is that if you get down this path of tit-for-tat retaliations, then it often gets out of control and other people do things and uh, make mistakes and, and overshoot the mark. So it's, it's destabilizing a relationship that took a lot of work to get in synchronization. You've been following the program. You've been uh, an expert on this program for many, many years, for almost two decades. And when you look at it now, the evolution of the program, was it a mistake on the part of the United States to uh, retire its shuttle program? I mean, up to now, uh, it used the shuttles, and more recently, it's been using Russian Soyuz capsules to get its astronauts to the space station. So was that a mistake to uh, basically get rid of the shuttle program? We have a system, system where the U.S. is changing horses in midstream, so to speak. It's retired the shuttle and then using the money that the shuttle used to cost to build a series of new vehicles to get people into orbit and back. Now, there is a gap. There's a gap. There was a gap between Apollo and the shuttle of about the same duration. This dependency is, is looked on as some sort of uh, asymmetric or unbalanced dependency. I, a, uh, uh, an inferior to superior kind of dependency. But if you look at it more closely, and if you work in it like, like I have and my associates, you see that both sides depend on each other. That even though we use the Russians to get into space, the Russians use us to have a place to go in space. And so it's not a case of one country hanging on the other. Both countries have built a codependence, a reluctant perhaps and not all that pretty, but one that's been remarkably stable over the years. And, you know, if we look beyond the technological uh, cooperation, if I can put it that way, I mean, there was a philosophy behind this cooperation. It was that there was a place outside of Earth where countries, even if they had different political beliefs, different ideologies, could cooperate together. Is that philosophy now endangered? Well, there's a lot of, of, of hype and, and well-wishing around the joint project. The project is, is international and the Russians are involved because it's a good deal for both sides. It may be inspiring, it is inspiring, that in fact people can set aside old enmities. But it turns out it wasn't a matter of cooperation that led the Russians to join the space station program. It was a matter of change in regime. And that in the past we could do symbolic dockings, we did one, we could have scientific exchanges, but they can never become part of the international partnership of the U.S., Western Europe, Japan, Canada, and other allies to do the space station until the Soviet Union itself collapsed. So there were political barriers. It wasn't just a matter of, oh, let's do it and, and make everyone feel warm, sing songs together around the campfire, and be friends in space. That took some while to get there. It has worked out. It's worked out in many ways surprisingly well. Let me turn direction now to uh, China and China's mission to the moon and its space program. Uh, how do you think China will perform with its space plans in the future? I think China will perform in the future as well as they have in the past, which is being very careful students of other people's experience. Learn from them where you can, learn what to avoid where you can. I wish people in, in the West would study our own space history and our own space mistakes as carefully as the Chinese specialists have, because they have gone through a series of steps reproducing Western activities, and now 
beginning to go and venture out beyond them. We're seeing not just a very impressive uh, small moon rover, and the next time they try it, it'll be, it'll be better and work better. That's part of progress. But the previous moon orbiter, the previous moon probe, Chang'e 2, didn't just orbit the moon. It was diverted at the end of its mission into some very interesting areas of space that are hard to reach, and then finally flew off into interplanetary space to probe an asteroid. Extremely inventive and clever mission. So we're going to see the Chinese have developed capabilities, and especially in the next, next year or two as they inaugurate a new family of bigger boosters on a new launch site down in the south to go far beyond what they've done so far. It's very exciting to anticipate the sorts of things they can do with the capabilities they have now developed and shown. And, you know, given all these new missions that are going to be undertaken by the Chinese, uh, do you think there's room here for more cooperation between NASA and the Chinese on future space projects? There still remain issues between the U.S. and China, as there were between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, about both political issues and, and other issues of, uh, of, of trademarks and copyrights and so forth. Those issues can be worked out first, and then things in space can progress. But there are other things that still can go on. For example, for crew safety, uh, NASA is allowed to deal with the Chinese. And a wonderful demonstration, probably helpful on both sides, would be for a Chinese Shenzhou vehicle in about two years to do a practice docking at the International Space Station as a potential uh, uh, crew rescue or bringing medicines or bringing equipment to the space station. It would not make China a junior partner in the International Space Station, which is a role they, they apparently do not want. But it would make them an equal partner in space exploration, each side willing to help the other in emergencies, just like we saw in the movie Gravity. Right, and I guess they would have to overcome some political opposition as well. I mean, we do know that there is some opposition to greater cooperation between NASA and China in Congress right now. It, there are, it's U.S. law. Congress had passed laws and signed by the White House, and it deals, it, it deals with issues beyond the scope of the space program. There are the same sort of issues that kept the Soviet Union from being a, a joint partner. After the Soviet Union changed political systems, uh, Russia became a partner, and it turns out rightfully so. You know, there are now other countries which are developing their own space programs. There's India, there's the European Union is developing a space program, Japan. Do you think that we're entering the era now of a new space race? We are definitely entering a new era of space operations. And it's very important to point that out. Thank you. It's, not, it's that the costs of operations look like they're about to be dropping. It's often not governments who do that. Governments, I know in the United States, when I wrote a book on space power for the military forces, the Space Command, they really didn't mind expensive rockets because the expensive rockets kept out most people from outer space. I'm afraid that barrier is dropping. There's access not just into orbital space, which still is expensive to get to, but even up-down space flight. We're going to see a lot more of that commercially, scientifically, in the next couple of years. So a lot of countries, and India has a fine program with some very ambitious activities. Other countries will be able to join in. Corporations will be joining in. We're going to be, and the develop, development in the U.S. of these commercial human access to orbit vehicles, three companies working on them, one or, two, one or two will be contracted to NASA in the future. All three will probably be flying within the next five or ten years to other destinations of space, not government space stations, but private, university, commercial space stations. We're going to be, uh, and, and recreational space stations. Right, sounds like an exciting future, but I just want to get back to the present. What do you think uh, is the immediate uh, challenge or future for the uh, ISS, the International Space Station? The International Space Station has developed with its partners, mainly the U.S., Russia, Japan, Europe, Canada, a stable relationship because every country is putting in effort and getting out benefit. What the Russians are worried about and the reason that I would not want to swap programs with them at all is that their dominance is only in one tiny corner of space commerce. Uh, worldwide, there's about $200 billion a year of sales of space okay. services. All and right, James, I'm going to have to interrupt there. We've run out of time. Thanks for joining us.